ஆர் <laughs> more than happy to volunteer for our academic session so big thank you to hilton number 2 a big thank you to all the participants and all the supervisors who have worked really hard the response has been phenomenal hence we have had to do two sessions rather than one we were planning one we have had to do two due to the, the phenomenal response which is really very encouraging number 3 let me introduce our today's panelists before the panelists moderators will be myself and dr vakas shafiq as uh, last time Dr. Vakas will moderate the first three cases, and I will moderate the last two cases. Let us introduce the panelists, our worthy panelists from across the country, which is absolutely brilliant. First of all, we have Dr. Dr. Alvi, endocrinologist, joining us all the way from Karachi. Thank you very much, sir, for your participation. And uh, sorry for the repeated reminders that I've had to send you. I just wanted to make sure that everyone is in place. So sorry for that. we have from islam from islamabad uh, shifa hospital we have dr umar yusuf raja endocrinologist thank you very much dr umar for the participation from lahore we have dr umal azmat from shokat khanam hospital again consultant endocrinologist thank you very much dr umal so let's begin the show and bismillah arrahman rahim so over to you vakas for the first three cases but just before that let me just run through the format the format is as it was last time we have five cases each candidate has 15 minutes in total for their case the first seven minutes will be for the trainee to present their case and that will go uninterrupted for the seven to eight minutes that the trainee has the remaining seven to eight minutes from the 15 minutes per trainee is for the discussion bit as soon as the trainee finishes the moderator moderating that case will um, just have a one to one discussion with the trainee one or two bits then we'll open the house to our worthy panelists one by one who can comment on the case and who can question the trainee regarding that particular case all answers will be given by the trainee him or herself as our worthy panelists are giving their comments or putting their questions forward one by one in that time the audience are worthy participants uh, participating as audience can throw their questions in in the question and answer panel so they can write their questions there as soon as the moderator has finished taking the views and questions of the three panelists then the moderator will go through the question list uh, there and then and if uh, there is any question that has not been put forward to that question will be taken by the moderator and put forward to the trainee and again the trainee has to answer that question so first one minute for the trainee in the last 8 minutes of the 15 minutes is for the panel panelists and the remaining 3 minutes from that 8 minutes will be the questions put forward by the audience and that is all we have uh, all the panelists are requested to mark the trainees as we go along we have a predefined rubric for that that has been shared with the panelists and then the panelists are requested to get the total done and just whatsapp me the picture so uh, i can do the total as soon as the final trainee finishes so that we can announce uh, the winner so over to you vakas for the first trainees and i am going to go mute now thank you very much atif um so i will request our first candidate uh, it's dr mohammad alim from uh, jinnah hospital lahore uh so over to dr alim uh, you can start sharing your case thank you sir am i audible to all and screen is visible yes okay okay i am dr mohammad alim for uh, endocrine fellow from jinnah hospital lahore uh my topic is uh, cases regarding a young female with hysterism regarding history a 24 year female unmarried uh, presented to our opd uh, with complaint of hysterism from 3 years it was of gradual onset uh, slowly progressive unrolling face and body with variable severity with fermin galvel score of 
there was associated history of non scanning acne on face on 3 years that was persistent with no complete response to treatment her menses cycle uh, was regular and family history was significant for histrism but there was no any history of any menses irregularities or any other uh, endocrine abnormality uh, and lastly there was no history of frontal balding voice change weight gain caudal tolerance skin bruising abnormal stria or any significant drug history uh, her examination uh, was uh, unremarkable uh, and uh, the bmi was 20 with blood pressure of 120 60 and there was no feature of pushing out or any vulvarization and uh, any obesity or any thyroid enlargement and then tanner stage was full <coughs> coming to our investigations uh, uh, her investigations uh, revealed testosterone of 15 8 nanogram per deciliter uh, which was done on 14th november and dhs level of 1065 microgram per deciliter at these uh, these labs was done uh, by uh, by some uh, gynecologist and and referral was made to endocrine uh, our endocrine center when there was high level of dhes and uh, testosterone also uh, the lhf and fsh was normal so we repeated uh, the labs uh, from other reliable source uh, with testosterone revealed uh, was 70.3 and uh, dhes level was 699 microgram per deciliter Where uh, TSH for lactin and 17 hydroxy progesterone was normal, and HbA1c was 5.2. So we have high testosterone level and high DHS level, uh, which which was documented. Uh, DHS was documented twice, where our uh, remaining level was normal. So we proceed with the imaging. Uh, ultrasound abdomen and pelvis was done, uh, which revealed no adrenal or any ovarian tumor. However, their ovarian size was enlarged with ovarian volume of 10.7 mL, and uh, whereas volume of left ovary uh, was uh, 10.9 mL. Both ovaries was enlarged, and they show predominantly peripheral range cystic follicles. Uterus was a normal size with endometrial thickness of 9 mm. So we have don't find any sores, and the patient's high DHS level with a uh, picture of uh, uh, multiple cysts in the ovaries. Uh, we proceed further imaging, uh, keeping in view of patient age and high DHS level of 1065, 1699. The MRI abdomen was uh, shows no adrenal mass, and MRI pelvis show also show no ovarian mass. Uh, while both ovaries contain a tiny peripheral follicle with average size of four millimeter. So we have uh, now proceeded on the management. on the basis of her clinical and laboratory evaluation, uh, evaluation such as patient uh, was having uh, non progressive symptom of hirsutism and there was no future of vulvarization and on biochemical labs there was slight increase in androgens although dh is was disproportionately more raised and there was no tumor on imaging and so uh, imaging uh, and ultrasound down was also suggestive of polycystic morphology So we keep uh, fever uh, has BMI was twenty. Uh, so we keep uh, have patient diagnosed as has as lean polycystic ovary syndrome, and she was started on combination of ethine estradiol and cryptorin acetate, and referral to dermatologist was made for the treatment of her acne and hirsutism. And she was also advised follow up after two months, and we decided to review her again. with clinical features and repeat testosterone and dhs levels so i have three discussion points uh, is this lean polycystic ovary syndrome can dhs level be significantly elevated in polycystic ovary syndrome or lastly should we consider adrenal or ovarian valence sampling keep, uh, keeping in view of her high dhs levels Thank you very much, Dr. Ali. Thank you, sir. So, coming to your questions, uh, the discussion points which you have written here. So, tell us about uh, is this lean PCOS? What do you think, sir? Have uh, has per step by step moving. To, first of all, is clinical features. There is no any rapid progression of symptoms. Symptom was from three years, and there is no worsening of histrism markedly in recent six months to one year, and her. There is no future of any vulvarization, and biochemical levels 
showed although te uh, testosterone was mildly raised, DHH was proportionally more raised, but other uh, hormone profile was normal. And the, on imaging, there was no tumor or any on ultrasound on an MRI. And uh, ultrasound also suggests that there is polycystic morphology with increased ovian volume. So keeping this all uh, his clinical features, his, uh, his biochemical labs, his imaging, uh, uh, I made a diagnosis of lean polycystic syndrome. And... Okay, fair enough. So in the PCOS, uh, is a diagnosis of exclusion. So you have excluded the tumors. So now you have diagnosed this with PCOS. Can PCOS have uh, raised testosterone and DHEA level? Well, uh, regarding DHS level, uh, we all know that DHS level can be elevated in polycystic ovarian syndrome. But the question is whether this proportionate rise is everywhere, everywhere, anywhere documented in, in literature. I have searched many literature uh, online and uh, as per accessible literature, the, I have found a level of 500 or around 510 documented in case board or case studies or in polycystic ovary syndrome. But uh, as we know that in the literature or in the, our guidelines, it is recommended to screen for other, any other cause if level of DHH is more than 700 or any, if there is realization, you can screen if there are more than 500. Uh, but in polycystic ovary syndrome, there are one to two mechanisms where, uh, where it is written in literature, can, we can explain a DHH level increase. First of all, although there is ovary hyperandism in you know, polycystic, but uh, there is reported that these levels, uh, these highly weighted androgens can go to adrenal where they get sulfated. So it is converted to DHAS. Secondly, uh, there's many uh, studies have been done, uh, which shows that actually in polycystic ovarian syndrome, adrenal are also having a hyper response, whether it is a sensitivity to ACTH or whether it is just there, uh, uh, there is hypertrophy of the zona reticulata. But these have been documented that the DHS level can be elevated by T2's mechanism in polycystic ovary syndrome. Okay. And what else can be the cause other than the tumors in PCOS, if there is anything else you consider? Uh, well, DHS, uh, sorry, can you repeat the question? So is there anything else you consider? You have done some tests, like you have done 17 hydroxy progesterone. Yes. Yes. I think yes. that's yes. what you've done for non-classical uh, congenital adrenal hyperplasia. Kid, can this be still CH, non classical <clears throat> CH? So there is one variety of CH that is 3 beta hydroxy steroid dehydrogenase. It, it is partial variety. We can, which can have a PCOS like picture, polycystic like picture, and can have a DHS elevated. But for that, we have to, uh, we have to have an endostyne dion level. So if we will compare that levels, where DHS level or is increased and endocrine diamond is normal. So we can say that this is a latent variety of the three beta hydroxystride dehydrogenase. But we, I have checked from uh, the Aga Khan or other laboratory uh, by a call, by a telephone call, but they are saying we are not doing the endocrine diamond level. Okay. And you have put there, should we consider adrenal ovarian vein sampling? And why is that? Why you want to consider this? So, so the, as we know that polycystic is a diagnosis of exclusion. And secondly, uh, the, there is, the, I have not found any literature of increased DHES level of this much of 1065. This is also from a reliable lab and of also of a, uh, 700 uh, in the literature in the polycystic ovary syndrome. But uh, having said that, uh, there is the indication for adrenal, ovarian and adrenal venous sampling are very strict because it's an invasive procedure and as compared to adrenal venous sampling for that hyperaldosterone cause, the sensitivity of the venous sampling for ovarian and adrenal is less. That is only 15 to 45 percent, depending on the expertise. Because in the adrenal venous sampling for primary hyperaldosteronism, we have some reference for cortisol level. We can be sure that we can check the ratio of testosterone to cortisol to check whether we are actually cannulated the vein. But in ovary venous sampling, we have no any reference. We are just to cannulate the vein. We get the sample of the of the uh, of blood from there and the final we have to compare that. So we we cannot be too much sure that that we have actually cannulated the ovarian vein or not. So guidelines suggest that if there is no future of visualization, so then you should proceed for venous sampling if the testosterone is more than 150 to 200. But in our case, that is uh, that is not the case. Thank you very much, Dr. Ali. So Thanks. now I'm going to request our panelists. Uh, they will they can ask the question from the um, from the candidate or can comment. 
So over to Dr. Zakir, please. Dr. Reem, thank you very much. A very interesting uh, conundrum here. Uh, my uh, question to you is, <clears throat> you said that it could be a variant of a CAH. How many CAH <clears throat> patients, how is it possible to have CAH with a very low level of 17 hydroxy with a strong at baseline? I know, unstimulated, but I think, as far as I understand, most cases of CAH would have a basal 17 hydroxy with a strong which would be elevated. So I have talked about the variety, special variety, that is a uh, partial later we not three beta hydroxy steroid dehydrogenase. Actually, this conversion of 17 hydroxy prognanol to progesterone. It is a step uh, above the 7 hydroxy progesterone. That is that is going to be partially deficient. So when there is, the pathway will move toward the DHEs, toward the uh, toward the androgens. So the DHS level will be elevated. We will not find the elevated 7 hydroxy progesterone. We will check the ratio of 7 hydroxy pregnol to, and to progesterone after STS stimulation test. So we do STS stimulation test to check the ratios of these all these enzymes pre and post of that enzyme. Excellent. Just one small short question. If this patient comes back to you and her DHEAS is still the same, 600 plus, what will you do next? So, uh, so we, then uh, next up will be the uh, uh, if I will check that if these uh, 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 endocrine level levels are available or not, we'll try to get that after a stimulation test. And secondly, if it's commercial normal, then I will counsel the patient regarding the uh, ovarian venous sampling because I have seen the case, check the literature where there, there has been case report is that ovarian tumor can have a elevated DHS level. All right, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Zakir. So now I'm going to request Dr. Umul. Dr. Umul. Uh, thank you, Dr. Vakas. Uh, very good case, Dr. Aleem, because we do see hirsutism quite often in our clinics as endocrinologists. And uh, uh, hirsutism, a lot of times, can also be idiopathic. We don't always find a cause. Uh, in this case, you seem to have found a cause. Uh, one of the things I wanted to ask you, did you check an estradiol level? Because uh, if we can go back to the slide where you showed us all the reports, I saw testosterone and DHEAS, uh, but there was no estradiol level. Did you check it at all or you? it's just not put here? But it's not done because his mens uh, menses were totally regular and he has no any complaint regarding that. So we just, uh, okay. there's no issue regarding. Okay, so then why did you check LH and FSH? Madam, it was done by the gynecologist. I have said in the start, this initial lab was done by the gynecologist and referral was made to us on the basis of tests, uh, uh, markedly raised DHES level. Okay, okay, fair enough. And then, um, so if you treat, do you think this patient has PCOS and you treat this patient for hirsutism, how long would you give this patient Diane 35 before you will see whether there's a response or not? And if there isn't a response, what else? What other pharmacologic options do you have? Okay, uh, Madam, it is uh, it will go uh, depend on the patient preference also. If patient is very concerned about hirsutism, we can start the second line therapy that is spinalactone after one month of starting of oral contraceptic pill. But if patient can he can wait and she can wait and he, he can uh, say that he look for some response of laser therapy and uh, and oral contraceptive pill, then it is recommended to start after six month uh, six month of starting of oral contraceptive pill to start a spinalactone drug. Right. So I would partially agree with you. I think that adding another after one month is very, very soon because you should at least give three months uh, for any response. I don't think a response would occur before that. So I think on average, you should wait for at least three, three months to six months before you add another one. So I think, uh, thank you. Uh, that's all I have for now. Thank you, Dr. Umar. So now I'm going to request Dr. Umar. Dr. Aleen, uh, can I, you can using the Rotterdam criteria, and I would argue against lean P, P cost because if you look at the NIH criteria, the, then the irregular menstrual periods is one of the definite criteria for diagnosing, um, for diagnosing P cost. And here you said menstrual periods are regular. We knew that in our population, familiar hirsutism is quite common and we don't have his start levels at all. So how we justify it, uh, mentioning it as a lean P cause? So why, what about 
could it be functional hypothalamic amenorrhea as well? Or how do you differentiate between functional hypothalamic amenorrhea and PCOS, given that BMI was quite low in her case? Sir, uh, sir, his, uh, so regarding that, his endometrial thickness was of nine, at the third day of cycle is nine millimeter. And uh, her cycle is doctor, uh, regular and there's no any future of any uh, hyperestrogenism and endometrial thickness is normal and there is any, not any concern from patient. And having said that, if the patient has a hypothalamic cause, then hysterism uh, along with increased androgen level can't be explained from the uh, that hypothalamic cause. What about the FSH LH ratios? Well, usually these are reversed in functional hypothalamic amenorrhea. You look at your FSH LH ratios. Yes. You sir. look at the so the LH FSH ratio is higher in P cause where it's reversed in functional hypothalamic amenorrhea, and you can see FSH here is eight and LH is six point six five. You will see in worst case. Uh, in terms of functional hypothalamic amenorrhea, you will see hirsutism, you will see BMI less than 23, you will see acne, you will see polycystic appearance, all of them you'll see in functional hypothalamic amenorrhea. The way you can differentiate is number one, FSH to LH ratio. Number two, I think I agree with you that your endometrium should be less than three millimeter in functional hypothalamic amenorrhea. So they are just five, maybe P cause therapy, but number three, and the important thing is estradiol that you have failed to do that. So I think estradiol is going to help you here, which you haven't done. So I think before doing estradiol levels, it will be very difficult to say or label it as a lean P cause. I would most probably suspect it's most probably functional hysterism because does this fam, uh, patient, does she have a strong family history of diabetes or not? No, sir, there's no family, strong family history of diabetes. So you are seeing a woman who at the BMI of 20 is presenting with a lean P cause as per, I mean, what you are suggesting with no family history of diabetes. So that's mean you haven't done now insulin levels as well. So what's the mechanism behind that lean P cause? We knew that insulin resistance is an important pathophysiological mechanism behind that. And you have no family history to suggest that as well. So I would, I would question your diagnosis here. I would think maybe a familiar hysterism or at least do an estradiol and think about functional hypothalamic amenorrhea. Okay, sir, sir uh, you have raised a valid question, sir. Uh, I will, uh, on the next visit, I will uh, plan. I can plan the estradiol level, keeping in view your concern and we, we can review our condition again. And for that, we have to swap the OCPs and then we can have a estradiol level check. Okay. okay, thank you very thank much. You. The only thing is, understanding beyond is being done at Shafar. Okay, thank you, Shafar, thank you for, uh, for adding the comment. Um, thank you. Uh, in the interest of the time, I think uh, we'll move to the next case. Uh, I can see there are a couple of questions uh, here, but I think uh, we'll take at the end if there is a time. So let me move to the second uh, participant. Um, so the next participant is Dr. Sara, Dr. Sara Ishfaq from Shokat Khanam Hospital. So Dr. Sara, can you please start uh, sharing your case? Okay, over to you, Dr. Sara. Okay, I'm Dr. Sarah Shfak, and I'm a fellow endocrinology at Shokat Khanna Memorial Cancer Hospital. Today, I'm going to present a case of a 41-year-old married lady who presented to us with a complaint of bilateral flank pain for about three months. At the time of presentation, we noted that she had an anterior neck swelling. Um, she was clinically youth thyroid. She did complain of palpitations that were intermittent, but there was no history of any headache or uh, sweating or documented hypertension. She had a strong family history of middle weight thyroid carcinoma on her paternal side, her father, her brother, uh, paternal aunt, uh, father's cuckoo and their ch children all had it. And her uh, brother and father had succumbed to this illness. On examination, her thyroid was asymmetrically enlarged with a palpable nodule of about two into three centimeter on the right side. And she had no cervical lymphadenopathy. So we started her workup 
and biochemically her calcitonin levels were uh, markedly increased. There were 954 picogram per ml, and she also had raised carcinoembryonic antigen of 135 nanogram per ml. Her TSH and free T4, they were uh, norm with a normal range. Now this biochemical profile uh, was suggestive of medullary thyroid carcinoma. She also had a hypercalcemia of 10.7 milligram per deciliter with increased phallic hormone intact of 276 picogram per ml. However, her vitamin D level was, her collected calcium was increased. So this picture was suggestive of primary hyperparathyroidism instead of secondary hyperparathyroidism. Uh, her uh, normethanephrine levels were with a normal range, but she has marginally increased metanephrine levels. Radiologically, uh, her ultrasound thyroid showed a right thyroid. She was subjected to FNAC that turned out to be Bethesda category 5. Now, as uh, she, uh, there was a strong family history of medullary thyroid carcinoma, so uh, it, we uh, got her CT chest, abdomen, and pelvis to rule out any other lesions. And there was a centrally necrotic 1.5 centimeter nodule in the left adrenal gland. And uh, there was also left non obstructive renal calculus and tiny specks of calcification in the right kidney. Now, these two findings were consistent with hypercalcemia. Now, although um, her metanephrines were only marginally increased, but there was history of uh, palpitations and there was a lesion, adrenal lesion in the CT scan, so we got her a DOTA scan. In this, the gallium 68 DOTA was injected IV and the radio tracer took almost one, we waited for one hour and the different images were taken with, spe with PEC CT and we found two lesions, a DOTA AVID um, nodule in the left adrenal gland and there was another lesion that was DOTA AVID in the right thyroid nodule. <coughs> it was followed by a parathyroid scan with uh, MEV. We took um, the different images were taken at 20 minutes, 60 minutes and 120 minutes and the early planar images showed a diffuse uptake, radiation uptake in the region of right thyroid lobe. And there was the normal washout of the tracer in the, uh, from the thyroid gland. Now this um, scan was then coupled with spec CT at uh, the delayed planar images in order to localize the anatomical structure where the increased diffuse uptake was noted. So uh, we found that there was a radio tracer uh, retention in the uh, soft tissue nodule posterior to the right thyroid lobe. So this was suggestive of a functioning right parathyroid adenoma. On the basis of all of these biochemical and radiological investigations, um, she was diagnosed to have the medullary thyroid carcinoma, primary hyperparathyroidism, and pheochromocytoma. So the diagnosis of multiple endocrine neoplasia to A syndrome was made. She initially, um, we prepared her preoperatively with alpha and beta blockade. She underwent left laparoscopic adrenalectomy and with no perioperative or postoperative complications. Her histopathology uh, showed pheochromocytoma of 1.5 centimeter and her pheochromocytoma of adrenal gland score was two. This surgery was followed uh, by a total thyroidectomy with central neck dissection and parathyroidectomy. Uh, this histopathology confirmed medullary thyroid carcinoma of size 3 cm. Um, three parathyroid glands were removed, and the histopathology of right superior gland turned out to be parathyroid adenoma. She has been in a follow-up ever since. As far as medullary thyroid carcinoma is concerned, she uh, shows excellent response, and there is no uh, evidence of any structure or biochemical uh, recurrence uh, of uh, the other malignancies as well. Uh, she's also on thyroxine. And um, so our uh, discussion points for today are that as genetic testing is not available in Pakistan, so how will we screen family members of men to a patient? And at what age should screening of family members be started? And should all patients with medullary thyroid carcinoma be screened for men to a syndrome? And if the initial screening is negative, then how frequent should we rescreen them? Thank you very much, Dr. Sass. So I'm going to ask the same discussion point questions uh, to you. So you mentioned as genetic testing is not available in Pakistan, how will you screen the family of MEN 2A patients? So okay. tell me how you are going to screen. Okay, so uh, all the available guidelines, they are uh, based on the uh, screening that is done according to genetic testing. So there are no available guidelines. 
for this answer, but we do have an expert opinion that suggests that all the family members of mbn 2 a patients, they should be screened biochemically. So uh, we use the uh, uh, tests like calcitonin, CEA, collected calcium, metanephrine, and normethanephrine levels. And um, so do you check all of these together uh, in, in a patient, or do you test one or two things initially, and if it's positive, then you check the others? So uh, the first, uh, the middle thyroid carcinoma, there is 90%, uh, 90 to 95% uh, penetrance. So we initially start with the calcitonin and CL levels. If they turn out to be positive, then we uh, move forward with the metanephrine or metanephrines because its prevalence is almost 50%. And then with um, connected calcium, because that's penetrance is like in 20 to 30% of the cases. Now the difficult one is to start screening. What age you start screening? Five years, till the uh, age of five years. Then we start screening at the earliest, youngest age of diagnosis. So do you screen them annually? Yes, we screen them annually. Because that will cost a lot, especially in country like Pakistan, where calcitonin CEA Expensive. Okay, um, yeah. so your next uh, question is, should all patients with MTC be screened for MEN2A syndrome? And if, if initial screen is negative, how frequent should we do um, again, get the metanephrine or metanephrine uh, levels done. And for our family, we have a parathyroidism, we will get the collected calcium level done. And do you do any imaging as a part? Uh, if, if for the initial screening, we just do the biochemical screening. And if it turns out to be negative, then we proceed with the radiological, uh, radiological confirmation. Okay. Uh, but with all MTC, uh, we, we should be checking uh, metanephrine. And also we do the CT chest abdomen and pelvis. Because then yeah, that, you can do. Do that. that can be done. Okay, uh, now I'm going to request our panelists. So, first, Dr. Zakir, please. Hello, hi. Uh, excellent case and uh, good question. My uh, question is uh, quite simple. Would you consider doing a medullary, uh, would you consider doing a prophylactic thyroidectomy? for these uh, immediate family members? Yes, uh, we actually, the prophylactic thyroidectomy is um, a preferable. Um, that is, uh, if we have genetic testing, um, then we, uh, when we, we proceed with a prophylactic thyroidectomy, um, actually, if the genetic testing is available, then the groups are divided into the highest, high and moderate groups. So in the highest group, the prophylactic thyroidectomy is done by the age of one years. In high group, that is done by the age of five years. In the moderate group, that can be done by the age of 10 years. Uh, however, in our region where genetic testing is not available, so we start with the biochemical screening and if uh, the calcitonin levels and CA levels, they are increased. And yes, we should uh, proceed with prophylactic thyroidectomy because there's a benefit in mortality. If um, there's an early thyroidectomy, then the uh, mortality is less than 5%. Otherwise, if it's the thyroidectomy is done after the diagnosis of the middle thyroid carcinoma, then the mortality is almost 10 to 20%. Yeah, sure. um, that really means that in our setup, without the genetic testing available, uh, shouldn't we doing, be doing our um, biochemical testing a little more frequently than they recommended? And uh, maybe uh, what age do you think they commonly uh, present with the middle thyroid cancer? Um, they usually, middle thyroid carcinoma, it usually presents by um, the age of 20, 30. So you'd start them at the age of five years and you do the screening every year? 
Yes, we start. We should start by the age of uh, five. And um, there's also the latest guidelines. They also suggest that if the basal calcitonin level is normal, then we can proceed with pentagastrin or calcium stimulation test. But that is not available in all of the regions. But if they uh, suggest the um, deranged elevated calcitonin levels, then that is also an indication of um, middle thyroid carcinoma, and we can proceed with thyroidectomy in these patients. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Zakir. Now over to Dr. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sara. Excellent case. Uh, not very difficult to diagnose, but I think the real challenge is how to follow these patients and the bigger challenge is how to follow their family members, which we're talking about a bit. So um, one of the comments that I wanted to make about uh, when you talked about screening of family members was also that um, you need to take a good history and do an examination of those family members as well, because as you said that normally, yes, medullary thyroid cancer is the first one that presents, but that's not a rule of thumb that that will always happen. So it's better if you take history. So for example, if you see someone's brother and they have history of hypertension or something like that, then you might want to do plasma metronephrine and non-metronephrine for, the, for them as well. Um, so that was the comment I wanted to make. Now, the question that I have for you is that since we don't have genetic testing, you did not genetically do any testing for this patient, uh, what is the clinical definition for your, this syndrome, men 2 a How do you clinically diagnose it? What's the definition? Um, if there's a family history of middle thyroid carcinoma and the patient herself has a um, the evidence of middle thyroid carcinoma or pure homocytoma um, with or without primary hyperparathyroidism, then that is diagnosed clinically with uh, multiple endocrine neoplasia. Okay, so that is partially correct. So basically, if you have manifestations of at least two of the diseases in the syndrome, then you can clinically say that this is a clinical diagnosis of MEN2. Um, I think that's about it. Uh, thank you, Dr. Thank Omar. You. Okay. Dr. Omar. So Dr. Sara, let me be a bit of devil educate here and I'm going to forward Dr. Zakir Aravi case. We are in mm -hmm. Pakistan, so let's be realistic. Genetic testing is not here. And the other important thing is the follow-up mm -hmm. because most of the patients, I mean, I think the follow-up is pretty much bad here. So in that respect, and then there's a financial aspect as well. And we know that calcitonin is quite expensive. So I would argue, and again, this is something which you can only read by, by, by discussion only. I would argue about perfective thyroidectomy because personally speaking, if you are going to monitor them, provided that they are going to follow you up every year for next 20 years or so, or 15 years or so, and that will cost them maybe more than five, six, seven lakh rupees, whereas a thyroidectomy might cost them 60, 70,000 rupees. And if they lost, are lost to follow up, then most probably, given the penitence rate is 90%, they will come back with an MTC with a high mortality rate. How do you argue, sort of, basically, we should not be offering them perfectic thyroidectomy at the age of five or 10 years rather than? giving them a chance and saying, oh, come back every year, you will have maybe 20,000, 30,000 rupees on those investigations and they will never come back. So what are your thoughts about that? Actually, um, as there are no will, um, guidelines on our region, like in, in these situations, so um, it is open to debate. And as there's an expert opinion that annually they should be screened, but there, uh, this is not very practical. So I think we should, a new guideline should be made and in which the prophylactic thyroidectomy um, should be considered in these patients at an early age group because that would be more yeah, But the guidelines are, yeah, and I agree, so the guidelines are going to be made by the Western people. I mean, Vakas and I have both work in NHS where we don't think about the cost at all. In Pakistan, they have they don't know the dynamics of the Pakistan. So I for me, I think personally thyroidectomy might be a better way forward rather than annual screening, especially when it came to MTC. But then again, there's no right and wrong answer. Uh, but given that sort of basically, I mean how do you prepare the patient for fear commercial cytoma, by the way? 
Uh, we actually, uh, first we uh, give the alpha blocket and uh, then uh, with or without the beta blocket. So the so, alpha blocket is given. Yeah, when do you offer them beta blocker? Do you offer them in all the cases or? Um, a, a beta blocket is offered uh, if there is any tachycardia after the alpha blocket. And we usually prepare them with alpha and beta blocket both. But uh, we start with alpha blocket in order to prevent the hypertensive crisis during the, um, okay. during the surgery or during the tumor manipulation. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Omar. Uh, and thank you, Dr. Sarah. Um, in the question and answer session, uh, section, there is no uh, question for you uh, here. So let me just quickly check. Uh, so let's go to our third case. Uh, and our third case will be presented by Dr. Sabiha from Arhan University Hospital. Over to you, Dr. Sabiha. Okay, sir. So uh, can you see my screen and I'm audible? Yes. Please go ahead. So um, I am Dr. Sabia Banu uh, from Aga Khan University Hospital. My patient is a young female with short stature and primary amenorrhea. So a 19 year old female patient presented with short stature and primary amenorrhea. On examination, she is a young, thin, lean female with short stature and short neck. The height is 147 centimeter with weight of 30 kg, BMI of 13.9. She has right-sided iatosis, right-sided epicanthus inversus, and blepharophimosis. Basically, right epicanthus in it towards the inner canthus, and blepharophimosis is narrowing of the horizontal palpable fissure of the eye. It will be showed in the next slides. On further examination, secondary sexual characteristics were found to be infantile with tenor stage one axillary hair, tenor stage two breast, and tenor stage two pubic hair. On further exam history, the patient's elder sister was 23 years old, also has short stature, primary amenorrhea. On lab workup, the FSH is 119, LH is 40.2, with the upper limit of LH is up to 15. Estradiol is 18.2, with the normal range is 19.5 to 144 picogram per ml. TSH is 1.9, FT4 is 1.2. Prolactin is 12.3, which is between 267 to 470 nanogram per ml. So uh, this lab investigation is consistent with the hypergonadotropic hypogonadism with low IGF-1 level. In the past record, her X-ray for bone age was done at the age of 17 years and it showed the delayed bone age of 10 years. The pelvic ultrasound was done, which showed there's a small infantile uterus with both ovaries faintly visualized. Karyotyping was done, which was consistent with 46XX karyotype. So these are the pictures. Uh, these are not from the our uh, uh, real patient as she didn't uh, give us consent to um, show her images. So these I took from the net and uh, this picture is showing blepharophimosis. As you all can appreciate, there's narrowing of the horizontal uh, palpable uh, aperture of the eye, more marked on the left side. And this is epicanthus inversus, which basically shows there's upward elevation of the skin fold from the lower eyelid towards the inner canthus. This is telecanthus, which basically shows there is increased distance between the both medial canthus of the eyes. This is telecanthus. And this picture shows the ptosis.
So in this patient, the diagnosis of type 1 blepharophimosis ptosis epicanthus inversus syndrome, BPS, was made. And she was started on estradiol valerate and norgestrel in a small doses and that was gradually built up. She started having regular menstrual cycle and on examination, the breast development now in the clinic follow-up is tenor stage 4. Axillary hair improved to tenor stage 2 and pubic hair improved to tenor stage 3. BPS1 and BPS2 deletion duplication analysis of Fox gene, Fox uh, L2 gene was deferred by the family due to significant financial constraints. We basically involved the genetic specialist in this uh, case and uh, the, as per his advice, the genetic workup uh, deletion uh, should be sent, but because of severe financial constraint, this was not done. So BPS findings, the blepharophimosis epicanthus to, uh, inversus ptosis syndrome findings are narrowing of the eye opening that is called as blepharophimosis ptosis and upward fold of the skin of the lower eyelid near the inner corner that is epicanthus inversus and telecanthus. This syndrome has two types, type 1 which cause the premature ovarian insufficiency in females and typical oculofacial changes while type 2 has only typical oculofacial changes, no pre premature ovarian insufficiency. Basically, this FOX2 gene is the only gene which causes BPS syndrome. This gene controls the production of FOX L2 protein, which is involved in the development of muscles in the eyelids, as well as growth and development of ovarian cells in the gland. So discussion points in my case are, uh, what are the chances of fertility in blepharophimosis ptosis epicanthus syndrome? Next, in the absence of genetic testing, how to screen family members? What is the prognosis of this uh, blepharophimosis ptosis epicanthus inversus syndrome? And what are, uh, what are the other associations to be screened? Thank you very much, Dr. Sabia. So let's uh, talk about your discussion points. So chances of fertility in uh, BPES. So in uh, these patients with type 1 blepharophimosis epicanthus inversus syndrome, the chances of fertility can be achieved with options like uh, we can uh, offer them for the um, oocyte donation or the adoption of the kid or um, one uh, um, experimental in, uh, therapeutic option is ovarian transplantation, um, in which there is uh, one article in uh, 2016, uh, who are immunoposal, and um, they have uh, reported that out of 14 patients who received this ovarian transplantation, um, uh, Basically, ovarian cortex was transplanted. Out of 14 patients, the, there were 11 patients who conceived within two to four years um, period. And um, they got the oocyte, uh, they got the ovarian uh, cortex uh, from their donors, uh, like donor relatives, like sisters, and in which four were uh, miscarried. There were four miscarriages. But uh, this is a, like experimental therapeutic option. Uh, first option, we can give the patient uh, like oocyte donation or embryo trans embryo donation or uh, option of the adoption of kid. And how common the BPES is? Uh, it is a very rare developmental disorder. It is seen in one in 50,000 uh, individuals as per the literature review. It is very rare. So in the absence of genetic testing, how to screen the family member? So like in this case, we were not able to proceed with the genetic testing because of the financial constraint. Uh, then we have to take a detailed history and examination of the family members. Like during our consultation in the clinic, we saw the elder sister who is accompanying the patient also has the similar features. And, and further history, she also told, she's 23 year old, she's having the amenorrhea, primary amenorrhea, and uh, uh, we have um, sent her 
a hormonal profile also. And family was again counseled for the genetic testing. So we have to basically focus on history and examination. Okay. And regarding the prognosis? Is it different uh, from... This uh, blepharophimosis epicanthus in... Blepharophimosis epicanthus inversus syndrome is a benign condition. It has no lethal consequences. Um, the only worrisome point is that the patients have the subfertility or infertility. Then we have to opt for the artificial reproductive uh, techniques uh, like embryo transfer or oocyte donation. These techniques are usually uh, offered to the patient. Otherwise, the corrective um, surgeries are available for the typical oculofacial changes which are seen in the patient, like um, canthoplasty is offered to the patient at the age of three to five years because these changes are present since birth. So we can offer the canthoplasty at the age of three to five years and then followed after one year, the correction surgery for the ptosis is offered. And these changes are then uh, uh, corrected. Uh, but as far as uh, infertility or subfertility is concerned, we have to give the patient other options like um, um, embryo transfer or oocyte donation or adoption of kids or in rare uh, cases that we can think of ovarian uh, transplantation, which is again an experimental. Fair enough. So screening for other associations? So I did the literature search on this. So basically this FOX2 gene uh, involves the pituitary gland, ovarian tissues, and the eyelid muscles. So basically these three organs are involved, rest are not involved. Uh, in eyes, as in addition to the changes which I pointed out, it also can cause nystagmus, squint, and um, refractive errors, both hypermyopia and myopia can occur. So we have to look for the other um, ophthalmological associations. And we sent our, this patient to ophthalmologist for further detailed examination and the options for the surgery. Other than oculofacial changes, it also causes ovarian uh, tissues. Uh, the, it causes the like uh, ovarian tissues involvement in which it causes the reduced uh, development organage in the organogenesis period of the ovarian follicles, and it also accelerates the follicular loss in the ovary. Beside this, it involves the pituitary gland, so it causes the hypothalamic, it involves basically hypothalamic pituitary axis. Beside these three organs, there are no other organ involvement in this syndrome. Like it doesn't involve the major organs of the body, like heart, kidney, or lungs. And was was the involvement of the pituitary was the reason that IGF-1 level was low? Likely. Likely uh, IGF-1 was low because of the pituitary involvement. And is that is a part of the syndrome? But rest of the pituitary hormones were normal. TSH and prolactin were normal. Sorry, okay. sir? Uh, is this the part of the syndrome to have low IGF-1? Or is that the isolated finding in your case? I think in my case, it was because of the pituitary involvement. But in other case reports, uh, when I reviewed in the literature, uh, the I low IG1 was not reported. Okay. okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Sabia. So now I'm going to request our panelists. So first I will request uh, Dr. Zakir. Over to you, Dr. Zakir. Uh, thank you. Um, interesting. Um, a couple of questions. Uh, so, is the BPES, do you think it's an inherited condition? Yes, it is an autosomal dominant condition. And um, in this case, in my patient, there was uh, no history of consensus marriage. And uh, two, only two family members among the six siblings were involved. It is genetic condition, autosomal dominant. And uh, uh, the each child from the affected parent has the 50% chance of getting this inherited uh, mutated gene, FOX2 protein, FOX2 gene. This 50% chance of getting this um, gene from the affected parent. So 50% chance of uh, transmitting the disease to the offspring. Right. And a um, uh, little comment, um, although I don't know much about this condition, 
but I believe that uh, finding a pituitary abnormality would not be an isolated thing in your patient. Uh, it is the the FOXL2 protein is involved in pituitary development and um, um, finding uh, growth hormone deficiencies um, is not something which has not been reported. It has been reported on a few occasions and the association is described. All right, that's it. Thank you. No more comments. Thank you, Dr. Zakir. Now I'm going to Thank address. you, sir. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Omar Lesmat. Over to you. Okay, uh, very good case, Dr. Sabiha. Um, I have a couple of questions. The first question is that you started this patient on estrogen and progesterone together, right? As replacement, as treatment. Is there any benefit of starting a patient on estradiol first and then adding progesterone after a bit, especially when someone's presenting with primary amenorrhea and doesn't have uh, secondary sexual characteristics that have developed? So basically, this patient was first started on the uh, estradiol. Um, I think uh, that is the Dine 35. First, she was given Dine 35 for a period of around two months, but the response was not good as far as secondary sexual characteristic and menstrual cycles were concerned. So after discussing this case in in our past meeting, this patient was switched to this combination of estradiol, valerate, and norgestrel, after which she started having regular cycles and uh, this improvement in the tenor so stages. Diane, and the, gradually the dose so was... So Diane better. 35 is actually a combination pill, right? Of ciproterone, acetate, and estradiol. It in, but she didn't respond to it. It was given for two consecutive okay. months. Then it was decided to switch the, the lady to uh, this combination of Norgestrel and Estradiol okay. Regulate. Um, and also, I think Diane being the first choice, it's a pretty high dose of Estradiol. And I think with these patients, because what you want to do is you want to follow what physiology would have followed if they had developed normally. So you want to actually start at a lower dose of estradiol and then build it slowly. And then you want to add progesterone a bit later because that's how physiology goes. So that would be one of the things. And then the other thing is that you have this patient on uh, hormone replacement therapy, which you do. Uh, till what age would you treat this patient? As far as hormonal uh, replacement therapy um, is concerned, uh, we will give this uh, to the patient till the age of natural menopause is like around the age of 44, 45 years so that she can have the regular cycles and her bones remain healthy. Is there an age recommendation by any of the society? Are there any guidelines for this? An age recommendation? Oh, as far as I have uh, read, it's up to 45 years, but I don't know exact okay. um, age so as per the guidelines. American College of Gynecology has, actually recommends treatment to the age of 50 or 51 years if there are no contraindications. Okay. Okay, that's all. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Omar. Uh, so over to Dr. Omar. So Dr. Sabiha, I mean, um, going forward, sort of basically from, or taking things forward from Dr. Omar K. It's, I mean, one of the reasons for giving estradiol alone is for breast development. If you're going to add progesterone, the breast development is going to be what you can say sort of deteriorate is not to be as good. So that's why you want to keep estradiol as much as possible before adding progesterone purely from the breast development point of view. But okay. coming, coming back to your fertility again, I mean, you have discussed about ovum donation, you have discussed about uterine transplant, all of them for a lady or for, for this uh, girl who, let's face it, could not even afford genetic testing, how is going to, she, she's going to afford, given that cultural, I mean, from the culture point of view, over donation will be accepted. I think it's not going to be accepted in our culture anyway. So these things are out of box already. So if the family came to you and, then, and asked you this question, what's the chances of spontaneous pregnancy in her scenario? So are you aware of any data about spontaneous pregnancy 
in premature ovarian failure? What did the data say? But sure, that was there was one case, case report. Uh, yeah, I'm uh, trying to say that might be the point. Um, there was one case report in the literature review in 2014. A Nelly Perez woman uh, was um, uh, she conceived and delivered twins. She uh, was treated with uh, gonadotropins. Basically, uh, the gonadotropin stimulation was uh, given, and uh, she conceived with the uh, twins. This there is only one case report in the you're not, aware of any, you're not aware of any French case series report any sorry so there's a French case series report which shows that the in premature ovarian failure about five percent can become spontaneous or can get spontaneous pregnancy so actually you can tell them that it's a five percent chance so five in hundred women with premature ovarian failure can get pregnant spontaneously I think that's important message just to tell them so they are aware it's not all doom and gloom. okay Okay, thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Sabia, there are uh, two questions here. Uh, do you consider growth hormone therapy? 10 year of bone age can't only be because of hypogonadism at 19 year of age. Do you want to answer this? Yes. Uh, so before uh, coming to us, uh, this patient went to multiple doctors in the city and even outside city and she was treated with growth hormone for almost two years and there was smile improvement in her uh, height. So she was given a growth hormone uh, for two years. And did you continue the growth hormone? No, when she arrived to us, she was 19 years old. So we didn't continue it. It was a stop one year before arriving to us. She received it in 2017 and 18. And I saw this patient in 2019. At that time, she was 19 years old, so uh, we didn't continue it. Okay. Because she responded, she yeah, has mild improvement in her life with two years of treatment, and it was costly for the patient. Okay. Patient family. Uh, the other question is, I think, already answered. She should have given ethanyl estradiol initially for development of secondary sex. Correctors, I think uh, during the discussion, this point was already discussed. Thank you very much, Dr. Sabiha. Um, and now I'm going to request Thank Dr. You, Atif uh, to take from here and he will uh, conduct the session. Over to you, Dr. Atif. Thank you, Dr. Ukas. So, fine. So, we are now left with the two final cases. So, without any further delay, uh, it will be Dr. Abdullah from Fat Memorial Hospital to present uh, his case. Over to you, Dr. Abdullah. Uh, Dr. Sabia, can you stop your screen sharing, please, so that Dr. Abdullah can. So I have stopped. OK, thank you. Thank you. So yep, Dr. Abdullah, over to you. Um, so that's it. Can you make um, Abdullah present his and share his screen? Thank you. He can. Okay. And but I don't see him in the panel list. Uh, I think we've lost his connection. <clears throat> Something like that. Anyway, uh, let's 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 move on. If a, if Doctor Abdullah is uh, back, we, he can present. He can present at the end. That's fine. Let, let's get him back to the panel. Oh, here he is. Here he is. Okay, fine. Over to you, Dr. Abdullah, for your presentation, if you can hear us. Go on, Dr. Abdullah, stage is yours. Uh, Dr. Abdullah, you're on mute. You have to unmute yourself.
can you hear me now uh yes go on start your presentation assalamu alaikum uh, my name is dr mohammad abdullah i am fellow sir can you hear me now yes we can hear you go on okay 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 assalamu alaikum my name is dr mohammad abdullah i am fellow endocrinology at fatima memorial hospital lahore and my case is of 25 years old prani gravida admitted in her 10th week of pregnancy for persistent nausea and vomiting for the last one month after ruling out all the other possible causes of her symptoms the diagnosis of hyperemesis gravidarum was made and she was discharged from the hospital However, two weeks later, she was readmitted due, due to her persistent symptoms of nausea and vomiting. Patient had no history of bone pains or abdominal pain, and she had no significant no significant family history. On examination, uh, she was dehydrated and had otherwise normal physical examination. In her workup, she was found to have raised serum calcium level, which was rechecked, and her corrected serum calcium came out to be 17.8 milligram per deciliter. Uh, she also had hypophosphatemia. So, on the basis of hypercalcemia and hypophosphatemia, her intact parathyroid hormone level was advised, uh, which came out to be very high, and thus the diagnosis of primary hyperparathyroidism was made. her urinary calcium to creatinine ratio was also more than 0.02 which ruled out the other possible diagnosis of familial hypocalciuric hypercalcemia her vitamin d levels were also very low uh, she also had hypokalemia which was most likely due to her persistent vomiting and inability to eat or drink anything her renal function test and liver function tests were normal and her hemoglobin was 8.9 her ultrasound of the neck did not reveal any parathyroid lesion uh, ultra abdominal ultrasound did not show nephrocalcinosis and fetal scan was normal the other radiological investigations to localize the parathyroid lesion were not done due to their safety concerns in pregnancy a uh, patient was started with intravenous normal saline at the rate of 4 to 5 liters per day along with i intravenous dimin hydrinate for her vomiting however the patient did not improve the, the patient was then started with steroids considering their some role in management of intractable hyperemesis gravidarum the hydrocortisone was started at the dose of 100 mg twice a day for 3 days and then was switched to oral prednisolone within 24 hours of starting the steroids patient's clinical condition dramatically improved in terms of her overall well-being and the frequency of her episodes also reduced as well the other drugs used to treat the hypercalcemia were not given due to their safety concerns in pregnancy as the patient had improved she was discharged from the hospital with advice to drink plenty of water vitamin d supplements and tapering dose of steroids the patient's serum calcium level gradually improved and at 17th week of her pregnancy the serum calcium level was 14.1 mg per deciliter by that time her symptoms had resolved completely at 20 25th week of her pregnancy she came for follow up and her serum calcium level was 11.5 mg per deciliter and fetal scan was normal after discussing with patient regarding uh, definite surgical management for her disease and the risk associated with conservative management the the decision was made to continue with conservative management and along with appropriate fetal and maternal monitoring after delivery we have planned to go for her biochemical workup for multi gland disease and other radiological investigations for the localization of lesion in parathyroid gland and then we will proceed accordingly
the discussion points are number one the role of steroids in hypercalcemia and in hyperemesis gravidarum and secondly conservative approach versus parathyroidectomy in pregnancy for primary hyperparathyroidism thank you Okay, uh, thank you very much, Dr. Abdullah. Uh, we would like you to turn your uh, video on as well uh, because I'm sure the panelists would, would want to see you as well and your confidence, et cetera, et cetera. So turn your video on. Let's stick to your last slide. So would what what have you read in the literature about role of steroids in hypercalcemia of hyperemesis gravidarum and um, of other etiology? Let, uh, let me on my... Uh, yep. There is so, yep. Yep. Go on. The, in literature the uh, role of there is some role of steroids in hyperemesis gravidarum. There are multiple case reports. Uh, the uh, symptoms of nausea and vomiting in intractable hyperemesis gravidarum improve dramatically within within first 24 hours of starting uh, IV steroids. Uh, there are multiple case reports and uh, in cases of hypercalcemia, uh, the hypercalcemia associated with chronic granulomatous diseases and uh, in some cases of malignancy induced hypercalcemia, steroids are useful. Okay. Any any idea about how do the steroids uh, work in hyperemesis? Like what's the mechanism of action? How, does it, how do they help the hyperemesis? Uh, well, the uh, mechanism is not well established in cases of hyperemesis gravidarum. Okay. And how do they work in managing hypercalcemia of uh, granulomatous disease like maybe sarcoidosis? How do they... In chronic, uh, in chronic granulomatous diseases, there is increase, macrophages cause increased activity of 1-alpha hydroxylase which converts 25 hydroxy cholecalciferol into 125 dihydroxy -cholecalcy so these steroids, as they have anti-inflammatory effects, they uh, uh, suppress the macrophages and thus uh, reduce the activity of one alpha hydroxy, and thus okay. they help in uh, hypercalcemia. Okay, so your conservative approach versus parathyroidectomy in context of pregnancy. What uh, what can be the risks of parathyroidectomy, and if yes, which part of pregnancy should it be planned for? Well, in literature, the uh, Treatment of primary hyperparathyroidism is uh, parathyroidectomy and it is performed in second week and second trimester of pregnancy. Uh, while the conservative or medical management in pregnancy is associated with a uh, lot of maternal and fetal risk factors like preeclampsia, miscarriage, um, maternal hypercalcemic crisis at the time of delivery and uh, neonatal hypoparathyroidism at the time of delivery. Okay, thank you. So let's go over to our panelists. So over to you, Dr. Zakir, please. Right, very interesting case. And um, um, first the comment, um, I, I didn't think uh, there was uh, much of a uh, role of uh, conservative management of such high calcium levels and hyperparathyroidism in uh, pregnancy. Um, and um, because as doctors have just said, there is a very high risk of earlier on miscarriages and preterm labor, uh, preeclampsia and uh, hypocalcemia and newborns so or not. And, it's a lot of and um, I think the standard should have been uh, parathyroidectomy uh, least in the second trimester. Even now, even the, the board has not sailed yet. We're still on the 25th week. So that's my comment. Um, question, Doxab, at um, what levels of calcium levels do you think uh, it is safe to continue uh, on a conservative management? Or in other words, what would be the threshold level for going for parathyroidectomy? Well, in literature, the conservative management can be can be done with calcium level of less than 12 milligram per deciliter. That's the threshold. Yes. 
my understanding was the threshold is slightly lower than that and more about 10 11.5 no indi would... indi indication for parathyroidectomy is calcium level uh, more than 1 mg per deciliter raised than the normal value but in literature uh, it is uh, found that uh, medical management can be done with calcium levels of less than 12 mg per day my uh, my simple contention is this woman had a very high calcium level and yes. several weeks later she still had a very high calcium level she down to 14 which is still very high for a pregnant lady and even now she is 11.5 and um, um well unless she is refusing outright her adductomy i think at least you should try to sell the idea to her uh, yes Uh, yes, uh, at her uh, at her follow up visit uh, at seventeenth week of pregnancy, the surgical management was discussed with patient, and she is actually not willing to undergo the surgery. And secondly, uh, her calcium her symptoms have improved, and her calcium levels are improving gradually, and it have come down to eleven point five from seventeen point five. Uh, so we are also hoping that with uh, increased fluid intake her calcium level might improve a bit more all right doctor i won't take too much of your time the only thing is okay, i think in my practice and my experience if you tell a mother of uh, bad uh, consequences for a newborn child mother is nearly always willing to go for any okay. i'm done thank you thank you so uh, over to you dr omal um thank you dr abdullah uh, very interesting case indeed i'm going to sort of start from where dr zakir left off so um obviously obviously the gold standard is parathyroidectomy in this case and she meets the criteria uh, there's no debate on that um one of the other things that you might want to consider also is 11.5 for someone who's in her second trimester is quite high because with pregnancy your calcium levels in a normal physiologic pregnancy your calcium levels actually come down a bit with volume expansion okay. so um a normal for someone who's not pregnant might be 10 but for the same person it might be 9 so yeah. 11.5 is still pretty high that's one of the things the second thing is is there um, is one of the issues for not going in with surgery the fact that you haven't been able to localize the parathyroid that's the issue uh, there are uh, two to three issues one is the willingness of the patient to undergo surgery secondly we uh, at the moment do not know what we are dealing with uh, whether it's parathyroid adenoma uh, hyperplasia or carcinoma and uh, to go for surgery at this stage would require bilateral neck exploration uh, and uh, the expertise of the surgeon here are also questionable uh in our point of view so these uh, two to three uh, factors have led us to continue with medical management of the patient okay and uh, just in the interest of time i'm just going to ask my other questions so you talked about vitamin d replacement right because her vitamin d yes. was really really low so yes. um for someone who has primary hyperpara versus someone who doesn't would you replace vitamin d differently or the same way Uh, to my knowledge it would be replaced okay so generally you have to be a bit more cautious when you're replacing uh, patients who have primary hyperparathyroidism their vitamin d because it can actually cause a worsening in their hypercalcemia so you have to do it a bit more cautiously and a bit more slowly um i think that's all thank you thank you dr omar so over to you dr omar Okay, I think I will just have a couple of comments from the previous audit panelists uh, regarding the where you can think about doing a conservative management pregnancy. There is a paper which says calcium level less than two point eight millimoles per liter. You can think about conservative management. More than that, of course, parathyroidectomy. Uh, the other thing is about vitamin D replacement. Uh, one of my colleagues, Asad Rahim, have done this study in, of course, not in pregnant women, but. Uh, We have discussed sort of this. We have checked uh, replace vitamin D in primary hyperparathyroidism either via giving fifty thousand units weekly or at cal D three two tablets or two thousand units, and not that much of a difference. 
Um, so whichever mode, but in pregnancy, normally they say is you can replace it by, you can give up to 5,000 units per day. So up to 6,000 units per day uh, is, is safe. So 5,000 units, you can, you can give them on a daily basis to replace vitamin D. But uh, Dr. Abdullah, I would sort of basically, I mean, I would most probably be, be reluctant in labeling this patient as primary hyperparathyroidism because you have mentioned urine calcium creatinine ratio is 0 0.02. Whereas in pregnancy, we knew that you can't use urine calcium creatinine ratio as diagnostic for uh, familiar hyper, uh, hypercalcemia, hypercalcemia and basically the genetic testing, testing you're thinking about. And with the vitamin D of four and the FHH of 0 0.022, which in my experience or in my opinion is questionable, why don't, don't you think it might be a FHH with just simply low vitamin D rather than primary hyperparathyroidism? I mean, what was the 24 hour urine calcium level in this lady case? Uh, I think it was uh, uh, 24 hour urine calcium was uh, 120 or 130 milligram. I, I don't exactly remember, but so I that mean, means uh, not more than 300 milligram per deciliter. And I think where I am actually stuck thinking about whether it's happening or I do sort of basically use 24 hour urine calcium as sort of a marker. And here the urine 24 hour urine calcium level is 122 your creatine calcium level is about 0 0.022 and a vitamin D level, which is very low at four nanogram per milliliter. So again, how do well, you sort of differentiate well, or how well, to sure? In, in this case, uh, in this case, uh, in literature, uh, it is recommended that when you start replacing uh, vitamin D uh, in the patient, the uh, urinary calcium excretion uh, should increase in patients of primary hyperparathyroidism and should uh, and is un, remains unaffected in familial hypoglycemic hypercalcemia. So uh, this uh, measurement can also be done to distinguish between these two. So unless you're not sure, I think offering a lady in second trimester parathyroid definitely when she's reluctant and then find out it turned out with FHH is going to be a receipt for disaster. Uh, yes, this is a very valid point and uh, we will look into this. Okay, the other thing actually is, suppose if it's, it is actually primary hyperparathyroidism, I mean, you have mentioned about ultrasound adenoma, but why about, what, what about CT uh, scan of the neck? Because, I mean, CTP we can give in pregnant ladies with the, uh, what, pretty much accepted that the risk benefit ratio will favor CTP, so you can actually offer CT to pregnant women. The, yes, radiation risks are high, but still it's not sort of be setting the risk benefit ratio favor in terms of CTP. And given the same logical approach, you can actually ask for a CT of the neck, which will be more accurate, I would say, than ultrasound scan to look for any adenoma. So what are your thoughts about that? Uh, yes, uh, uh, considering the risk versus benefit ratio, this uh, CT could have been done and uh, MRI is also another good alternative uh, radiological investigation which can be done in pregnancy to localize the ligand in parathyroid gland. However, in literature, it is recommended that you do not go for radiological investigation or localization of the ligand until you have decided to go for the surgery. So uh, at the moment we are uh, not planning or we have not decided about the surgery, uh, if, uh, but once uh, surgical decision has been made, we will definitely go for it. question about it, what do you think about the role of furosemide in pregnancy? Uh, furosemide is a category C drug and uh, again the risk versus benefit uh, should be considered in about, uh, for this drug to be given in pregnancy after restoring the volume uh, in hypercalcemia patients. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Umar. Thank you very much, Dr. Abdullah. So let's move on to our last but not the least presentation of the day. So we are left with the last 15 minutes and we're still running on time um, because we started 10 minutes late as well. So. Our last trainee to present her case is Dr. Fauzia from JPMC Karachi. Over to you, Dr. Fauzia.
Dr. Abdullah, uh, you can stop your screen sharing so that Dr. Fozia can uh, share her screen. Uh, Dr. Abdullah, please uh, stop your screen sharing so that the next uh, trainee can screen uh, can share her screen. Thank you. What happened? Uh, uh, Dr. Fozia, uh, yes. your turn. Share your screen. Okay. So, uh, assalamu alaikum. My is it my screen is uh, visible? Yes, your screen is visible. You are audible. Come to your first. Uh, come to your slideshow so that you start from your first screen. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Fozia, I think you need to click I'm on the first, first slide. It's the last slide. Yes, but uh, slide. Yeah. Slide show. Slide show. It's the top right in the bottom. bottom. No worries, no worries, Dr. Hosea. Just relax, calm yourself down. Just press the slideshow tab. It will be at the top, slideshow. So the option was... Uh, yeah. Dr. Fozia, can you see this uh, mark of 78% in the bottom? Yes. It's right besides that. No, 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 on the left side, on the left side, on the left side. Yes, this one. There you go. Let's make a start. All, all over to you, Doctor. So, Bismillah uh, ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum. I am Dr. Fazia Qasim from Jinnah Postgraduate Medical Center, Medicine Institute of Diabetes, Endocrinology, and Metabolism. I am going to present a case of six sisters. This is the family tree of a Pathan family. Uh, father died, and mother is 53 years old. Actually, this is a story of 10 siblings of non consanguineous marriage. We can see here that uh, the two sisters are normal. The youngest is 17 years old, still menstruating, and she's single. And the other is married and with children. The two brothers are normal. They are married and have children. There are six affected females, five with primary amenorrhea and one with uh, secondary amenorrhea. So psychosexual orientation of all these patients is females. Starting with the first patient, uh, who is seven, 18 years old, up to the sixth patient who is the eldest, 33 years old. Actually, this is the patient who first came to us with primary amenorrhea and on inquiring about the family history, we came to know that uh, other sisters are also suffering from the same kind of problem. So we asked her to bring them to us and they came to us over a long period of time and we did their workup. Five of them had primary amenorrhea and one with secondary amenorrhea. Uh, three of them are single at the moment, five are married, but they, uh, none of them had children. Uh, Youngest sister has deepening of voice and she has history of beta thalassemia trait. One of the sister is also suffering from diabetes and hypothyroidism. Like the youngest, eldest has history of beta thalassemia trait. None had galactoria. And regarding hormonal uh, uh, pills intake, younger sister never took uh, the pills, uh, while the other four uh, uh, took estrogen progesterone pills uh, over a long period of time intermittently. 
None of the sister has any signs of uh, virilization. Uh, none had temporal baldness or hirsutism, um, except for the youngest sister who had prominent Adam's apple and jaw, uh, broad jaw bone. As compared to the other sister, she has uh, female pattern pubic hair, clitoromegaly stage two. And all the sisters had stage five breast development. We can see here that none of them was hypertensive. Interestingly, the, all of them were taller than their expected, their uh, estimated mid-parental height. Uh, three of them were obese with high BMIs, and uh, the, the exam, genital examination of the uh, five sisters, apart from the first, was normal female genital uh, genitalia. This is the picture of the youngest patient with uh, prominent jawbone, prominent higher bone, mild clitoromegaly. These pictures are taken with the permission of the patient. Regarding investigations of these patients, we could not do all the investigations in all the patients as uh, they belong to the poor social uh, economic class. So most of the investigations were done with the support of medical, uh, Medicine and Endocrine Foundation, which is uh, working in the medical unit too for the support of the patients. So coming here, we can see that the estrogen, uh, estradiol was normal in the younger two sisters while it was low in other patients except the one, and probably she was on hormone uh, replacement at that time. LH was high in all the patients. FSH was normal in the younger two, but it was in the menopausal range um, of the other four sisters. So these four sisters have hypergonadotrophic hypogonadism. Testosterone was done in the younger two sisters because of mild signs of virilization and the patterns of hormone. So it was high in the youngest sister and normal in the other sister with, the, in, uh, with reference to the male range. Uh, we did testosterone in other two patients just as a prototype, uh, although they were, none of them had any signs of virilization and it turned out to be normal. Uh, because of raised testosterone, we did uh, DHT, dihydrotestosterone, in two of the young patients. We can see here that the DHT was high in the youngest, and it was in the normal range for the other patient. We calculated testosterone to DHT ratio, and even the uh, ratio was low, uh, as uh, with the lower than the normal reference range. And so we ruled out the 5 alpha reductase deficiency here in these patients. Prolactin was normal in all the patients. AMH was done in view of androgen insensitivity syndrome, and it was quite high in the youngest patient. We did uh, uh, AMH in one of the patients from other group, just as a prototype, and it was normal as it was expected. TSH was normal in all the patients. Because of raised testosterone, we did karyotyping in the younger two patients. And uh, as a prototype in one of the patients from the group of four, it was uh, the 46 XS, but in the younger patient, uh, it was 46 XY. DEXA scan was done in one of the patient from the first group, it was normal. It was done in the other three patients and the, uh, it was in the osteoporotic range in the eldest one, while the other two were on the way to osteoporosis. Genetics testing for AR gene and the POI gene panel could not be done due to financial constraints. Artson was done for all the six sisters with, uh, with the single operator, by the single operator and MRI was done, uh, was also done. Uh, I am showing the pictures of one uh, of the patient from each group as a prototype. So we can see here that the uh, pro small prostate is present here, bilateral inguinal testicles are present, and uh, there is a uh, uterus and ovaries are absent in uh, younger two patients. While in uh, all other four patients, uterus and ovaries were present in all, except in the youngest, in which we could not appreciate the ovaries. So, ladies and gentlemen, coming to the conclusion, in summary, um, patient one and two who presented with primary amenorrhea, with increased testosterone, DHT, AMH, and LH, and normal FSH and estradiol, uh, have 46 XY karyotype, uterus and, uh, uterus and ovaries were absent, with the presence of bilateral inguinal testicles and prostate has the diagnosis of complete slash partial androgen insensitivity syndrome. While the patients with uh, patients uh, three, four, five, and six, 
uh, three with primary and one with secondary amenorrhea with markedly elevated LH and FSH and decreased estradiol and uh, uh, uterus and ovaries were present in all except for one as the diagnosis of premature ovarian insufficiency. For sisters with POI, uh, counsel uh, uh, with regards to the long-term hormone replacement therapy, marriage and fertility constraints, while the sisters with uh, AIS were counseled for affirmation of gender identity uh, in keeping uh, with their wishes and surgical removal of testes followed by the estrogen replacement and future referral for vaginoplasty. So coming to the discussion points, the, the uh, discussion about the unifying diagnosis about the reason for raised AMH in AIS patients for uh, question about gonadectomy, when and why, and reason for the tall stature of these patients. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Fozia. Very, very interesting and novel case, uh, shall I say. So let's uh, try to wrap it up. So can you, as per your literature search, come up with a unifying diagnosis for this family, shall I say? Uh, <clears throat> I take literature search to uh, try to find out uh, whether these same, uh, uh, these two disorders have ever happened together in one of the family. But I could not find, and this is the first time to see these very different genetic disorders of uh, gonadal dysfunction in, in a single family. Although there are case reports about uh, uh, the siblings with uh, uh, either AIS or with POIS, uh, there are case series reported, but uh, this I could not find. And uh, in, in and, uh, our case, therefore, highlights the importance of uh, taking each case individually and uh, importance of, uh, uh, of doing the work for examination of each case uh, carefully and in a proper way, even if the siblings are presenting with the same complaint, because if, if it could not be done in this way, there are substantial chances of missing the diagnosis. Okay, excellent. And so raised AMH in the people with AIS, what's, what's the mechanism? Why, why is it raised? What do you think as per your literature search? Uh, because uh, AIS patients have AIS. So the uh, AMH, there is continuous secretion of uh, AMH in these patients because of negative feedback inhibition, because of the uh, uh, dysfunctional androgen receptors. So, and this is the reason that AMH is very much important for the diagnosis as well as for the follow of these patients. And uh, I, I found one case report in GMIT journal in, uh, published in 2017 and, and uh, uh, about the, the, the that uh, the AMH was very much high before gonadectomy, and it uh, dropped down in the boots after. Uh, very important in making diagnosis and. Problems. Okay, so the the sisters you're planning to do gonadectomy, when at what yes. age you're planning? Uh, uh, it is recommended that these patients should have gonadectomy. Uh, uh, why? Because. Uh, there are chances of malignant transformation of uh, the gonads, uh, of intra-abdominal gonads. So this is the reason that it is recommended. And uh, it and uh, until uh, the patient uh, achieves the puberty. Uh, the reason is that the patient uh, should, uh, should achieve puberty under the influence of androgenic uh, and androgenous hormones. And the second reason is that the uh, chances of malignancy are age dependent. Before puberty, uh, the chances are less, uh, around 5%. And after puberty, it increased up to 13 to 14%. And after 50 years, substantially increase, uh, substantial uh, risk increased to 55 uh, to some 33%. So uh, this is the reason these patients would undergo gonadectomy. Okay, and 
So all sisters are at all stature. What's, what's the explanation for that? This is very interesting finding, but for AIS patients, uh, there is a reason. And usually, the, and for that reason, AIS patients are usually taller than their, uh, from their, uh, the females of their society. And this is because of the presence of the, uh, this uh, growth controlling gene that is present on the Y chromosome and it regulates the so this is the reason uh, for tall stretcher in AIS. But in POI patient, I uh, could not find the reason. I, uh, in literature search, I found one paper which uh, uh, about one case with uh, tall stretcher, POI, and vascular disease. And the reason for that was the duplication of SH1 gene that was short stretcher homeobox gene. So there is duplication of that gene, and it can lead to tall stretcher. But our uh, patient uh, was uh, did not have any vascular uh, disease features of any vascular disease. Okay, excellent. Thank you very much. Let's turn to our panelists. Uh, over to you, Dr. Zakir. Oh wow, what a case! <laughs> this is, I mean, uh, an incredible case. Uh, I really don't have questions, but I was wondering about a uh, little short statement. So we have. Uh, two uh, siblings who are XY, and among the other four, uh, at least we know two are XX, and presumably the other four who are POI are also XX. So you have four uh, XX females who have premature ovarian insufficiency, and you have two uh, XY who are androgen, in, androgen insensitive. Unifying it. Uh, the androgen receptor gene is on the X chromosome, right? And the androgen receptor gene is expressed in the ovaries as well. And there is, there is some, although controversial, some belief that the androgen receptor uh, gene abnormalities may lead to POI. So maybe in this family, a problem with the X chromosome androgen receptor gene is the common unifying thing between the two. So it caused the uh, AIS among the genotypic uh, boys and uh, POI in the genotype females. That's my state comment. Uh, don't, don't have really any questions. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Let's move on to Dr. Umal Asmat. Uh, thank you, Dr. Fawzia. That definitely is a great case. So, um, and I may, might have missed that part in your presentation. So you said that there was a diagnosis of complete slash partial androgen insensitivity syndrome. What's the main difference between the two? Um, why we uh, thought, in, in, initially we thought this is complete, but the youngest female, she has mild uh, tracheomegaly. So this, uh, this is uh, actually the feature of the partial androgen insensitivity. The, Complete uh, AIS patients, they have complete female uh, external genitalia, but in uh, but the partial uh, the genitalia could range from the female with mild cleptomegaly to the male with uh, hypospadias or with micropenis. So this is the reason. Although from other, and, and it, uh, she, she has mild, uh, there's deepening of voice and prominent hyoid bone. Uh, that also, and all these three features uh, of mild viralization were not noticed by the patient. We are the one we noticed, and we asked, uh, we asked her about that. Um, so, in, in this regards, we are thinking that one is complete and other is the partial. Okay. Um, and then, as far as management goes, you did talk about surgery, the gonadectomies, and you talked about hormone replacement. What else do you need to do for these patients? Uh, with, with regards to bone uh, pro uh, protection, we can uh, first we uh, must ensure that they must take a hormonal pills regularly. Uh, we must ensure about the compliance and tell them about the importance of that. And then, on the long run and in, in follow up, we can 
um, we, we can I mean, uh, start with the other anti uh, other treatment for osteoporosis. Okay, so you don't you don't really need treatment for osteoporosis, but you do need to do annual DEXA scans for them, or if not annual every other year, so that you can follow their bone health. And you also yes. might want to give them calcium and vitamin D supplements. And then yes. as you said that there's a certain age recommendation for gonadectomy, which is normally after 15, because as you mentioned that you want them to have the benefit of the hormones. So if you've already uh, determined that this patient does have AIS at the age of 10, then till the age of 10 to 15, is there any sort of surveillance you will do for the gonads before you uh, actually do the surgery? We can do surveillance for the malignancy or? Right. The, the, uh, I think I need to do some more literature search for this. Okay. So the recommendations generally are that if um, you're waiting for surgery, you if the gonads are in the inguinal canals, then you can do an annual ultrasound. And if they're in the abdomen, then you'll have to do an annual MRI to keep an eye on them until you actually take them out. I think that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. So let's move on to Dr. Umar. Hey, Dr. Fozia, I mean, I've got two questions. One might be a simple one. Might, one might be a slightly difficult one, but that's fine. Sort of basically, I think your cases are quite good. Let me just start with a simple one. What do you think the role of AMH in females? anti murine hormones in females? why we should do them or when we should do them? This is done to see the ovarian reserve. If the, like these patients, we are suspecting there is ovarian insufficiency, so we, by checking the AMH, we can see still is there any reserve. And uh, so any, any chances of pregnancy is there or not? And I mean, sort of, I mean, if you, if you listen, sort of, you have a chat with a with a reproductive endocrinologist among us. Most of them then think that the role of AMH in females is regarding fertility when it came to IVF. Yes. And just to look for the ovarian reserves, it might be something that they don't recommend. Uh, rather than it's purely the role is mostly in the IVF setting to see yes. whether IVF will be successful or mm -hmm. not. So I think here I can see sort of basically from the males or from the, your androgen insensitivity syndrome point of view, you might want to confirm the diagnosis because they do have the raised AMH as well. I mean, my other questions, I think my, my last question will be, it's going to be a bit more tricky sort of this. I mean, you have mentioned about unifying diagnosis. Now, in medical sort of business medicine, we have got these two philosophical approach. There is this Occam razor, and there's this hickam dictum. So what do you think might be in your cases, which one you are going to pursue, the Occam's razor or hickam dictum? So your question is very important and pertinent, but uh, I'm sorry that uh, at the moment, I don't know the answer. I need to search for this. So the Occam razor, just sort of, the Occam razor is sort of how we are trained in medical school is to try to find a unifying diagnosis, a simple explanation for all the different presentation. Like in this case, there are two different, one family, two different sort of basically uh, presentations and you're trying to sort of basically think about a common reason behind that. Whereas Hickam dictum is, well, actually it's been first pronounced by Dr. Hickam, who is a prominent American physio uh, physician who mentioned that the patient can present with as many pathologies as like, or in this case, this family can present with two different pathologies, and we might be sort of busy because we're training thus way that we're thinking about unifying diagnosis. So what do you think? It might be just two different pathologies in one family. Yes, it sounds like that, but because of some genetic, ge genetic, I mean, Maybe they are having, uh, they are, no doubt there is genetic problem. So th there is a genetic problem at different levels. So you're thinking more toward an Occam razor approach rather than a Hickam dictum approach? This, uh, this second one. Okay, all right, thank you. 
Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Dr. Omar, and thank you, Dr. Fozia. So you can be on mute now and you can stop the screen sharing if that's okay. So I'm going to hand this over to Dr. Vakas. We have now finished the session. Uh, I'm just waiting for the panelists to send me their, uh, their results and I shall be announcing them in the next five to seven minutes. So it's over to Dr. Vakas to uh, entertain you until then. Thank you, uh, Atif. Uh, I must say all of you have performed really well, uh, regardless of whoever win the competition. You all are the winners because you all have performed well. You all have um, shown the courage to come to the screen, share your very interesting cases, uh, share the discussion points. And we all have learned. Uh, there are many things uh, which I learned and I'm sure there are uh, many uh, Participate. Uh, many uh, people in the who are attending uh, have learned a lot. Uh, they were very, very interesting casings, especially the last one, and uh, there was one uh, by Dr. Sabiha. Um, probably many of us have not heard that case uh, before, and it is the first time we heard the name of that syndrome. Um, so everyone have performed very well. So let's see who will win the title today. Now, looking at the questions, um, let me look back. So there was someone have asked initially um, for the first case for Dr. Aleem that uh, why SHBG was not checked. Uh, I'm not sure is, if Dr. Aleem want to answer this. Although I have written the answer that normally when the testosterone is raised, that's when we check SHBG. Um, uh, for DHEA sulfate, I'm not sure either that will be of any help. Um, then there was a there was a, a comment regarding um, either instead of OCP, should we consider H, uh, HRT? Um, well, HRT can be used. Um, however, in Pakistan, I found that OCP is actually cheaper and easily available, uh, but HRT will be the better option. Uh, for that case, but OCP is easily available. Um, then there was, which I asked already, was regarding the growth hormone therapy. Uh, then there was a, then there was regarding ethanyl estradiol, which we have talked already during our discussion point um, for inducing um, puberty for Dr. Uh, Sabiha case. Um, then there was a couple of comments all. So it looked like primary para, but 24 hour urine was done when vitamin D was only four. And then there was another person answering that we do not need urinary calcium excretion with 17 calcium and 40 PTH. So I think I agree with that, that if the calcium is very, very high, um, then primary hyper probably is more likely, but we had a very good discussion on this topic. Um, so I think that's all. If anyone have any uh, questions, you can put it here. We'll try to answer. And there was a comment. Congratulations to all participants from uh, Dr. Gulshad. Rare interesting cases with learning points for everyone. Thank you, Dr. Gulshad, for attending uh, this session. And thank you, everyone, uh, for attending this session. And many thanks to our panelists. Um, who are who have given the score? I can see Dr. Atif's screen is visible, so I he might have the results. Atif, have you got the results yet or not? Yes, so we have the results. Uh, and and uh, just as Dr. Vakas said, I would like to thank everyone who has participated, everyone who is in the audience, and especially our worthy panelists. Before I announce the winner, let's take a, just a quick uh, round of um, like. Um, comments about the session itself from the comments and then we'll finish it off with the results. So Dr. Zakir. Uh, excellent presentations. I really enjoyed them. The cases were really, really good. I enjoyed the way the, the fellows have presented and it's nice to see their presentation skills really coming up and uh, enjoyed the presentations. So I really have uh, nothing more to criticize so, except for praise. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Omal, please. 
ji so i would say that uh, first of all very well organized so that is kudos to dr atif and dr vakas and then i think the fellows uh, the cases obviously were very good but sometimes even if you have a really good case how you present it makes a big difference and i think the presentations today were very very good they were very to the point there weren't you know unnecessary details that would confuse the audience so i think that was very well done and some of the credit again goes to the organizers because i know they worked hard with the uh, with our fellows to sort of um, make sure their presentations were crisp which they were um very good presentations very good cases and uh, yes i think uh, it's a great activity i think i've learned a lot uh, through this i'm sure everybody has if nothing else it, it brushes our uh, sort of uh, memories because a lot of these things we don't see on a daily basis um so yeah i think great effort thank you thank you dr umar now again i think they are excellent presentation now i think i try to be a bit more hawk among my two dub panelists <laughs> but otherwise i i think the main thing for 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 uh, the uh, the fellows are uh, in medicine i mean what i found out is sometimes better to 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 go in in a gray zone i think sometimes you will find so surprised that it's not going to be or oh, you have to make the diagnosis sometimes you wait 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 till you got more and more and more sort of basically information in terms of diagnostic clinical history investigations and then think about that and and that's why those comments sort to of be say about the lean peak or so the hypercalcemia in pregnancy it's always better to wait till you make a, a say premature diagnosis and then commit to a management option that you might regret later on and i think most of us have learned that maybe hard way and i think that's part sort of basically because the investigations again the lab sort of basically one thing i learned quickly in pakistan actually is that don't be too much don't write too much on your labs because you don't know you see the best of the labs and they will make mistake in pakistan especially uh, i think that might be the case even in uk or usa as well but i think your clinical judgment should proceed and if you are in doubt ask your colleagues i mean i do ask all to basically i ask to cause i ask atif i ask abbas i ask usama always ask them and it's still not sure wait 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 till you are sort of basically um are sure what what you you want to do so again excellent cases thank you very much dr umar so um everyone is a winner but for the sake of formality and for the sake of um, the competition we have to declare a winner so today's winner is dr sara from um, shaukat khan excellent dr sara um, we are waiting for your um, winning speech dr sara are you there so we, we we want to have your winning speech please keep it brief Uh, yes, well I'm done, Doctor Sir. We want to see you on screen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. good. Yeah, and uh, thank well you done. so much. Um, the guidance by you and Doctor Kars was immense, and and also uh, my supervisor, Doctor Omar Azma, and I um, have learned. I have found. I have actually um, had the opportunity of seeing many syndromes and cases cases at Shaukat Khanum, and we have all these radiological images um, available, so we are able to. Um, proceed with the latest investigations and apply all the guidelines um and this is a very a good platform uh, for all the fellows to learn and participate so thank you all of you thank you very much dr sara so your prize this time is uh, black while is uh, latest edition of uh, textbook of diabetes which you and the previous winner will be getting over the next 3 4 days it will be couriered to you we'll get your address so vakas closing remarks from me it's uh, allah hafiz and thank you vakas you can close the meeting off no everyone have done really well and the the best part is that our candidates have answered very well so thank you everyone uh goodbye from all of us allah hafiz and i hope we will have more event like this thank you okay allah hafiz allah hafiz